an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Regional Master Instructor Marty Miller here with fellow Regional Master Instructor, Miss Wendy Bats. Wendy, how are you? I am so good. How are you? Great. Thank you. You know, we always look forward to doing this. And I'm going to say, in a sense, kind of backed by popular demand, <laughs> we are doing another version of Do This, Not That. Yes, we have talked about some risks versus benefits. We've talked yeah. about what exercises we like to do, um, you know, what exercises we, we choose not to do. And this actually, the um, webinar was brought to you by one of our lovely trainers that um, had contacted us because there were some questions regarding specific exercises that they've always done. And I think that's the big takeaway today, which we haven't even started, is just because you've always done it may not mean that you should continue doing it. <laughs> right. So. And, you know, with this week's topic, we sometimes we run into it accidentally when we're talking about other topics. And, you know, this is where I think we want to carve out some very specific time on this. And I think this is something that there's no way we could cover all of the exercises um, that could be uh, falling into this category. So, you know, I'm interested to hear the feedback from all of you amazing uh, NASM, you know, family members here. And this could be something that we revisit every so often because there are so many exercises that we could dive into. Mm -hmm. And, and again, you know, we want to just kind of bring your attention to some of the exercises that we stay away from, or that we think is maybe a high risk. Um, but, you know, if you choose to do it, it makes sense for your clients. You feel that it's safe. They can maintain proper alignment. You know, that's just something that you you absolutely love or it's a client's choice. I mean, that's the that's the beauty of, of, of designing programs is you've got to do what's in the best interest of your clients. It's just Marty and I really want to pinpoint, hey, if you're going to do this, just be extremely careful because, you know, of the stress that you're causing here or are you truly getting, you know, are you truly activating the muscle like you think you are? And I think that's that's one of the, you know, one of the things I'm excited about today because I, I could talk about this all day. This is one of my favorite topics ever. And, right. you know, that's basically what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the popular exercises that we considered, you know, we, again, Marty and I consider high risk just based on movement well, I think we've got some rationale behind that, though. We do. Well, again, based on movement and and the way that the body was intended to move. Um, the big, big one, too, is you always want to have a purpose for your exercise selections. Don't do it just because you saw it in a magazine. Don't do it because you saw someone really? do it on Instagram. Um, you know, make sure that it makes sense in your programming, that it's progressive, but not excessive, if you will. And then also provide self or safe exercise alternatives. And Marty and I have talked about this, and and I know we say this every you know webinar, but we really want you to think about ways to regress every exercise that you're going to give a client, because we don't want to set them up for failure. We always want to have set them up for success. And then again, how would you progress that one exercise all the way up to power if if we asked you to do so? Right. And Wendy, I, you know, I know that um, how we both have a very similar thought to this is, you know, both of us being uh, working in teaching this uh, at the graduate school level. If we ask somebody to design a program, we would expect somebody to say, I chose this exercise because comma and then give an explanation. I'm in this phase of training. I'm trying to target these muscles within this movement pattern. There's a rationale. But what we don't want is, well, I chose it because it's leg day, period. Right. It's there has to be that next level of intellectual thought process behind why we choose things. As you said, some people just make the choice because it looks cool, but they don't really have or they don't spend the time to critically think on, well, what's that exercise going to do? 
Is it moving me more towards my goal? Is it um, kind of violating any of the five kinetic chain checkpoints? And is it helping my client fix their movement or is it maybe potentially causing them potential harm? And at the end of it, I look for high reward exercises with very low risk. That doesn't mean you still won't get an amazing workout. Probably get a better workout because we're truly targeting the movement patterns we need to target. And I will say, guys, if you have ever emailed me before, and I don't know, Marty, if you do this, but you come and you ask me this question because I get this very often. Hey, Wendy, you know, love your podcasts and webinars, right? Because I know that's how everyone's going to start it because you just dig us. But um, but then it's like I do this with my clients. And what do you think? And so I always end up writing back. So I'm just telling you now ahead of time, this is what my reply is going to be. Why do you always do it? What was the assessment? What's the purpose of it? And why that particular exercise? What are the acute variables? And then I hit send. And so, so the thing is, is Marty and I had the same mentor, not just Dr. Clark, but we also had um, Rodney Korn, who I absolutely adore. And I owe a lot um, of my knowledge and my learning from him as well. And I would ask him a question. And every single time I would ask a question, that's what he would counter with. He right. never told me the answer. He always made me critically think through it. And it's one of the things that I love the most about my learning experience was because I had to dive deeper into to the questions to where I'm like, man, I'm just going to go and figure this out on my own. And he was like, then I did my job because you won't want to just come to us. We're not going to tell you the answer. We're going to ask you the whys, the rationale, and then what's what are you trying to target? What's the prime mover? And is that is there something else you can use as an alternative if it could be harmful to a joint? Um, and there's a few of those that we're going to talk about. And you'll see what we're like as we go through it, you'll look at the picture and be like, huh, that makes sense now. Oh, those days back in Calabasas, California. I know. Marty, I'm telling you, those were so fun. I mean, there Absolutely. you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, That's where we first met. <laughs> That's right. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Marty, you talked to us about the rush. Ago. Do yes, the Russian, 17 plus years ago. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I know well, who's counting. So Russian twist. This is one that I want to throw in there because I think it's uh, an exercise that is highly overused because it's a core exercise and people understand they have to twist. Okay. I get that. But when you look at the version on the left, I'm not saying never to do it, but I, to me, I have some other alternatives. I like better, more bang from my buck. Right? So when I look at the person on the left, first thing I look at is, okay, their feet are off the ground which means even if they were on the ground, because that'll be the next question. Uh, oh, and this is, Wendy, I was thinking about this. Somebody, if you email me, what's the, your favorite exercise for this? I have the same similar reply. I'm like, what's the assessment? What's their phase of training? So that just jarred in there. So if even if their heels are on the ground, they have to be activating their hip flexors to stay in that 90 degree position. Not saying that's bad, but I know that the majority of people are going to have overactive hip flexors. So I may not choose to do that. Wendy, we had talked pre on a previous master instructor roundtable where the hip flexors insert into the body and where they originate from. So they go right from your low back into the front of your pelvis, create an anterior shear force if they're overactive. So this is probably not my favorite way to do a, a Russian twist. And again, what I see people do is they keep their spine straight and they just move the ball. How much twisting am I really getting, Right. Yes, I feel a burn in my abs because I'm isometrically holding myself, but I'm really not getting rotation from the part of the body that I need, which is my thoracic spine. So for me, a version that I love, I did these today, is I'll do a half kneeling. I can or can't, don't have to put the band there. That band is pulling his knee back towards the machine. So he has to push out slightly into abduction to prevent adduction. So he's getting... Uh, reactive neuromuscular training is forcing him to fire that muscle subconsciously if he knows that his knee can't move inward. And then depending on the lever arm, you could be straight. And then he's going to rotate over that front leg. Hopefully we would cue that only from the thoracic spine. And then he's also getting hip internal rotation on that lead leg. So much more bang for my buck than just firing up the uh, hip flexors and just moving a ball and getting very little, if any, thoracic rotation. Yes, I'm a big fan of those. Anti-rotation, power off presses, you know, cable rotation. 
And, you know, again, think about daily movements and how often are you literally sitting on the ground and moving in that way? I'm not saying that you don't ever do that. But again, we've talked about when we were discussing some of the subsystems, um, especially in one of our previous uh, master instructor roundtable, you know, you want to think about the sacrum. And oftentimes when you've got overactivity and the piriformis, you've got um, weak glutes, which we know obviously is very common. Well, if you're in a hip flex position, we're actually sitting on a weak muscle. And then we're locking that down and then trying to rotate from your lumbar spine, which again, we don't really want to rotate necessarily from that area in the beginning anyway. Um, you know, there, there just can be more stress and strain placed in that position, especially in the beginning. Because think about we talked about phase one. We really want to do little to no joint motion of the spine. Well, now we're already adding rotational movements. If you did what Marty was talking about, and even if you just look at this picture, I mean, that's a pallet off press. That's a phase one right there. Holding that three to five seconds, bringing it into the chest, relaxing and repeating again, holding out and then bringing it in nice and slow and punching out, just doing that repetitive movement. You're getting a lot out of it and you're still phase one. You start adding the small rotations from side to side. You've got phases two, three and four, and then you go more rotational explosion. You've got phase five. So one exercise you could do in all five phases that's safe, that works multiple joints at the same time. Um, to me, I, I, I prefer this one over that one. Yeah. All, and if anyone's, time. if anyone's thinking about phase five, all you would have them do is be still in that kneeling position. They would have a med ball and then mm -hmm. they would just turn and explode into a wall or something and, or, you know, let it go. And then you roll it back to them. So again, this is, uh, I think uh, a home run and so valuable. And again, eliminate the added stress on the spine. Yeah, you can even do a cable, just lighten the load and go faster. Or bands and go fast. Right. And the yep. band's awesome because it pulls you back. So you have to control the eccentric. So, so many cool things. So many cool things. Very good choice. <laughs> all right. If we go to the next one. Oh, all right. You guys grab your popcorn. Here we go. So we're going <laughs> to talk. About, we're going to talk about dips. Now, I am not personally, again, personally, I am not a fan of dips. And I know I've probably had many people at this point turn off our, our webinar. So I'm going to apologize to you, Marty. Hang in there and listen to why. Um, but the thing is, is if you look at, now the thing about what we're trying to focus on with dips is to work the tricep. And if you think about what the triceps do, they extend, right? They extend your elbow and slightly extend your shoulder. And so if you think about what those two things of what you're doing, and then you look at that picture there's no extension of the shoulder happening at, at that point. So you're actually just, you, you know, you're, you're not even getting full available contraction. When I say shoulder extension, it, it's only to a certain point. It's not how, like really far back. So it's just, you know, going back just, just a little bit. So, so that's one thing I want to get full contraction of a primary muscle that I'm trying to target. The second, second thing is those are, there's three heads that make up the tricep. Yes, but they're very small muscles. And so now I'm going to go ahead and drop off of a, you know, chair, bench, whatever, put my body weight on there. And I'm going to start, you know, going down and then pushing myself up. Yes, I can de-weight myself by bringing my feet back. So I get that. But the big kicker here is think about the five kinetic chain checkpoints. If someone's doing this, look at the angle of the humor, like the humerus. So think about the, 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 the arm, the upper bone. So the upper arm bone, your humerus. Look at the location that it's pointing and think about the 90 degree angle that you make when you go down and the amount of stress that you're putting into your shoulder capsule and think about your shoulder capsule. Remember, it's a very shallow capsule. So your ball and socket joint in your hip is pretty. I mean, it's it's hugging that hugging that joint, your shoulder, not so much. It's pretty shallow and it lays in here. Plus, you've got your rotator cuff muscles. You've got your bicep tendon. You've got a lot of things that need to go through that really small space. And so if I go into a dip and I start to put my humeral head into the front or the anterior portion of that, and I'm just jarring on it, think about the amount of stress that I'm putting on those muscles, the amount of force, and literally have seen this in real life. It's a true story. I've seen someone do this and have that humerus pop out of that shoulder socket because they went so low in a dip. But Wendy, if I do dips, you know, I can do them anywhere and I can wear this really cool belt and load this chain and put this like huge weight on the bottom of it. So then I look like an amazing person doing dips. You do. However, I'm going to think about the safety of your shoulder 
And I'm going to think about what was the purpose and the rationale, which is to work the triceps. So some safer alternatives to get full available contraction, which is going to be what we're looking for, would be something like a bent over, you know, um, kickback. You could do tricep extensions on a cable, keeping your shoulders back, keeping your chin back. You know, even on the cable, when people round their shoulders forward and they just go into their quads, y'all, that is like that. Don't do that. Stand up nice and straight. Stick your chest out and take your hands to the outside of your your um, your legs, you know, in the outer outer by your IT band. Go go there or past it because then you're going to get full contraction. And that's one of the things that I want to say that to me puts my shoulder in a safe position. I'm getting full contraction. And it's just these, these hurt my heart because I know what it's doing to my shoulder. Right. And but I, I you, feel it. Yeah. I mean, you could always do pushups if you had to, if you need to be at home doing it right. It's safer. But you know, when you see the gentleman on the right, think of all the work in his scapular, you know, thoracic area too. You know, Cause he's almost doing like a standing Cobra. So again, so much more bang for the buck. I couldn't agree more Wendy. Well said. Yes. And those of you guys that are joining Marty Miller and I on this week's master instructor round table, we're talking about do this, don't do that. Or do this, consider that. Maybe that's what we should change it to because we're not telling you not to do something. We just really want to try to get you thinking when you're programming what may be some better alternatives for, uh, you know, your, your risk versus reward type thing. You know, more bang for your buck, keeping the body safe and in the proper kinetic chain check. Oh, here we go. And I, I'm, I am a culprit of growing up in the late eighties, early nineties. I could crush me some dips and I was phenomenal with upright rows. Thank God I got into sports medicine early and I learned, um, upright rows. Yes. A lot of people are going to work their lateral delt and their upper trap. First and foremost, how many people need to activate their upper trap it tends to be overactive anyways. Now, if you're a bodybuilder and you're going into cosmetics, that's a sport. We do things that are risky when we play sports. We've talked about this before, but as an athletic trainer, if I wanted to see if you had shoulder impingement, Wendy just talked about all the anatomy in the shoulder and all those things, if they get squeezed, we get that kind of that achiness. And Wendy, you and I've seen this, somebody gets off a chest exercise. And the first thing they do is this, that's not a dynamic warm up for your shoulder. That's your rotator cuff screaming for help. And the first thing I would do is I'd almost put you exactly in the impinge in the, uh, the upright row position to test if you had shoulder impingement. Why would I ever load it? So again, there are times where you need very strong traps. Again, not many people need to elevate their shoulders, but they might have to be able to carry something. So if they retract and depress their shoulders, but if you're carrying something, those traps still have to work isometrically. So I love carries, and then I love PNF patterning to get a more functional uh, pattern of the shoulder and I'm still going to develop my deltoids and all that, but I'm biomechanically my shoulder coming right off what we just talked about. The dip is in a biomechanically safe position versus a biomechanically high risk position with something like an upright row. Very well said. I'm going to agree. <laughs> I had a feeling you looked at this before we went live. So probably. Yes. Yes. And then, Oh, okay. Oof. All right. So back in the day, you know, behind the neck, neck or behind the head, neck presses. Um, so when you think about a bar and you're doing a lat pull down and you're at the gym and you lock your legs into that machine, you're grabbing the bar and you take it and it's super heavy. That's why you lock your knees in. So you don't like fly up in the air. Right. Because I try to lift it as heavy as I can. And then I think about bringing my head forward because if I didn't bring my head forward I was going to hit myself in the forehead so probably wouldn't be a good look so I'm going to bring my head forward I'm taking this and driving it behind my head and then I'm going to repeat again I've got myself locked down and it's super heavy even if it wasn't heavy I have to think about the positioning we know that most common compensations in the upper body is a forward head and rounded shoulders and so if we think about that alone, and then now I'm loading it and trying to get a bar behind my head, think about if I don't have the proper range of motion in that shoulder capsule and for it to be seated correctly, I'm putting a lot of stress because I don't have the range of motion because I'm so tight in my pec minor and my pecs, it's driving my shoulder forward. Now I'm trying to lift a heavy load to get it behind my back. 
then what's going to end up happening? I can increase the chances and more stress to that joint. It could lead to tears, strains, issues going on and just the shoulder. Plus, with it already being in a forward position by looking down, by looking at technology, we know that the head's usually forward in a lot of people. I'm feeding into a common compensation, which I definitely don't want to do. Plus, there is a certain position that your shoulder should go into that is the safest position. And when you get behind, that means you're more stable than mobile. And there's more mobile than stable areas of your shoulder. And so you've got to think that now you're taking this bar and you're trying to bring it behind your head and your body just doesn't have that range of motion. Now you look at this position while it looks painful, his shoulders, they don't look so bad, but this is Arnold. I'm not Arnold. Your clients probably aren't Arnold. And if you saw a common compensation in an assessment, probably not the first thing that you should do. Yeah. And second of all, too, I'm out of the five kinetic chain checkpoints, which we know if we start to compensate in one area, then we're not getting full activation throughout. And so, and Marty, when, I mean, I know you are a huge, huge fan of the bottom ups. I love them as well. But I'm sure there's more you want to add to this behind the neck press. Well, I, I think you mentioned it, it so eloquently, whether you're doing a pull or a push, it doesn't matter right? Whether you're pulling a bar down towards you or you're pushing it in, in a shoulder press like Arnold's doing, it doesn't matter. It's the exact same, just the force is coming differently. But think about when you see his neck, look at the sheer force that's going through. And again, remember, Arnold was a professional athlete. He's willing to put his body at risk. Now, here's the cool thing. We've learned from the research that you're going to get more muscle activation doing different things. But this was in the mid 70s, probably. They didn't know that. But also the one thing we're not showing Wendy is what's going on in his low back. He mm -hmm. probably had to flare his low back to get his arms behind because most men, I can say this uh, on my left shoulder, I do not get the external rotation I would need to get that bar behind my head. So if I was going to do it, I'd have to throw my chest out and arch my low back as well. So it's just one of those incredibly high risk, whether you do a pull or a push and then the bottom up. Wendy is so amazing. So I'll let you kind of jump into that. It's, it, it is one of my favorite exercises for sure. Well, I mean, you've got to think, what are, what are you trying, you know, what are you trying to, to work? And, and so I'm not saying don't do a, you know, a straight, a straight bar pull down. It's just, if you do that slightly lean back, maintain your five kinetic chain checkpoints and take the bar and have it hit your chest. You're still going to be working your lats. If that's what you're doing as a pull down, you're going to be working your lats with that bar. So I'm saying that is fantastic. You're staying within the five kinetic chain checkpoints. You're not putting excess stress on your shoulders. You're targeting one particular muscle, which is hopefully what you were trying to do in the very beginning. So, so I'm not saying don't do that. And the same thing with my presses. Anytime I have a client do a press, whether it's with a bar or even with dumbbells, which I prefer dumbbells mainly because of the, the uh, stress to the elbow. And I don't like to lock, like lock their um, elbows in with a bar, just me. Um, but I still have them slightly bring in because they don't put that excess stress going back and I can also maintain it. Am I still doing a press up or a pull down? As Marty said, because, you know, we're, we're working two different, um, two different muscles because we're doing two different exercises. Either way, I'm still maintaining, um, proper alignment, reducing the amount of stress and still activating the, the prime movers that I was going to activate if my hands were behind my body. <laughs> That's the big thing too. So but with the bottom up, I mean, you're working grip strength, you're working shoulders, um, you know, it, it depends. You can even bring it down and press it all the way up because then you're doing a press up at that point. So you are going to get some lat, um, some lat. You're going to, you know, I mean, there's so many different exercises that you're doing. Plus with it just being in one hand, you're working like the core as well because you're only loading one side. So you've got to maintain proper alignment throughout your body in order to maintain the, the proper alignment. And I love the grip strength component mm -hmm. and the, the uh, stability too, because again, with me having less external rotation on my left shoulder, the same weight, I truly have to work so much harder where if I was on a bar, I could push through with the right, not even maybe necessarily realize I have a compensation in my left. So it's, it, I think it's one of my favorite upper body pressing motions for sure. You keep talking presses. I keep talking pull downs. We have presses written down. I did see that, but I get so ex like this, this, this drives me nuts when I see it. That's at the why I said either way, it's the same, but yes. Yes. But, but either way, just don't do it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I, agree. I mean, choose Jury. to do it if you want, but I don't think that's a good look. Personally. Not our favorite. Not our favorite.
That's a better way of saying that. Oh, you go for this. You know, God bless people for trying to get creative and work the glutes, but let's not get over creative. Like the five kinetic chain checkpoints. That's kind of, I always say, I don't make the rules, but you tell me the rules, I'll play the game. Biomechanically, I want everything in, in order where everything's lined up. I don't know necessarily where the curtsy lunge, I can understand why people think it does, but it's probably just more jacking up your piriformis, which lies underneath the glute. But your length tension relationship of your muscle, your glutes in a lengthened position, which means it's going to be weaker. And mo she's actually doing a reasonably good job of keeping her front knee in somewhat of alignment. Generally, I, I don't even see that. So when I look at where the foot is to comparison to the knee, it's just so much strain on the joints that it, I, I don't see the value in it. So if I want to maximize the glutes, I'll do things like you know, lateral tube walking. And that could be a whole hour webinar and seminar on what we do on how to do it properly. But I think people understand that. And then look how good this lateral lunge is, right? So if you want to get some frontal plane activation, I get that. So that's why we have the tube walking. But this gentleman here on the far right is doing a really good job of keeping both feet pointed straight ahead. His, his right leg maybe a tiny bit, but we're nitpicking. His posture seems really good. And then if you look at his left leg, his foot straight and his knee is almost in perfect alignment. Now we're taking a snapshot, right? But look at the difference in his positioning versus her positioning of the knee. And then think about also, there's going to be some adduction. So what's going on in the pelvis. So I'm just not a big fan of curtsy lunges. And it's not just because of the name either. <laughs> well, and I think it's, you know, another thing to this is if you look at the lady on the left in comparison, um, think about when we have you do the overhead squat assessments, what are we looking for? We're looking for parallel lines from the frontal plane. She's very up and down. And what we've found and the reason why that you were looking for, you know, um, parallel lines is because there's equal weight distribution between the ankles, the knee and the hip when you have that small lane. Now we're not talking in an excessive forward lane and we're not talking about anything crazy, but that's, you, you know, that's what we're actually looking for are those parallel lines. We know that if someone slightly leans forward and they load their front leg, they're going to get proper activation of the quad and the glute, which is a prime movers and a lunge. If somebody, which most people are very, very tight in their hip flexors, very tight because they sit all day or they're super active and they don't take the time to actually truly get good alignment in their hip flexors. It's an overactive muscle that's very, very common. If someone doesn't have that and you're trying to keep upright, just like this lady on the left, then a lot oftentimes people say, I feel this in my knee. I can't do a lunge because I feel it in my knee. Well, it's because you're trying to keep up, keep your body upright. You don't have that extension because your hip flexors are so tight. So therefore it's going to cause excess strain in the back or the knee. So often you'll see a, a, an increase in an arch or you're going to see, you feel pain in that back knee, let alone what Marty just said with the front knee, because now you're putting all this excess stress because it's not even properly lined up with anything. So to me, that's one of the reasons I don't do that. I do like the forward lunge. I'm with Marty. I am a huge, every single program, every single program I have a client do, they come in, they foam roll, they stretch what needs to be stretched. The first thing they do is grab a band and do two walking right. every single person, because I know that glutes are super, super weak. Their um, abductors are usually very, very weak. And so we usually do some sort of two walking and bridges. You know, and, and Wendy, when you look at the gentleman on the far right, think about the power production he could generate with those glutes, right? Because mm -hmm. he's in the biomechanical, you know, uh, kinetic chain checkpoints, you know, whether that's male, female, whatever, doing the curtsy lunge, you're just not in an anatomical position to drive. And if you were trying to activate the glutes, you want to be in that power position where you can truly push off kind of about the ground reaction forces we talked about before in another master instructor round table. See, there we go. So it's just, there's so many more benefits to it uh, um, from activation and less risk. So for those of you joining in right now, thank you so much for joining in. Wendy and I are going over what we call some potentially higher risk exercises or exercise that may need a little more uh, investigation on the why. So we're going over do this, not that, because this is a conversation we have so many times with all of you amazing NESM fitness professionals people see an exercise and they really want to tear into it and talk about it. And we want to go through some of the common ones. So I encourage you to go back and listen to what we've discussed before and then give you some safer and more beneficial potential exercises.
Yes. And remember, when you do a lunge, the front leg should do all the all the the work. So on a curtsy lunge, try to get your entire body weight up on that lunge in that position safely. Right. And the back leg, right. we need to talk about that position, but that's okay. <laughs> Very true. All right. So I mean, we could we only just chose a few exercises that that we commonly see. Plus, we've been getting a few emails. And so we're like, you know what, we're gonna do a webinar about this because we want to make sure that that you know, we're taking your emails and we're looking at the audience and we're trying to say, OK, you know what? We want to answer some of these questions. And when we start to get multiple of them, that's what ends up making the uh, <laughs> making the show. So our big um, key takeaways is when you're looking at the exercises, you always want to focus on working the prime mover at a low risk, maintaining proper alignment. So therefore, you're going to get better outcome with the chances of reducing injury, which is the whole purpose people come to see us. And then you always want to think about the five kinetic chain checkpoints. We put them in there because biomechanically, if you're standing within the five kinetic chain checkpoints, you're going to be working the muscle that you're trying to work as ideally as you can versus being in a compensation um, position and then trying to do an exercise. So we're thinking about safety um, plus neuromuscular um, efficiency, which again means the right muscles firing at the right time and the right plane of motion. That's what we're trying to achieve, especially in phase one. Um, and then think about your exercise library. You know, if you want to look into different exercises, I mean, I have bought so many different books of exercises and guys, it's pretty much the same. You know, any exercise that you think makes sense, somebody can do without compensating, they're doing it with, you know, with a really good tempo and under control, then they own that. Then that is a great exercise for that particular client. But just because Marty can execute it perfectly, I may not be able to do that. So for my exercise library, that might not be appropriate for me right now, but I want to work up to be Marty one day. You know, everybody wants to be Marty one day, right? So think about that. You never, want to, you never want to sacrifice your form for a number, but you don't want to sacrifice your form from the beginning because of the positioning of the joints, especially if it's something that could lead to potential danger if you're not careful. And as Marty said earlier, and as I will say on every email, as I reply back, and as you'll hear us talking about it, if I ask you for an exercise and you give it to me, I'm going to say, well, that's an awesome exercise, but why do you do it? And you should always have a rationale for your why. Always know your whys. That's super important. It's going to make you a better trainer. Your clients will eventually ask you, why am I doing this, this exercise? I really don't like it. Like, well, you may not like it, but it's going to be beneficial because when you go to do blah, 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 you're going to be able to move better. You're practicing these same movement patterns when you're doing your activities of daily living. I'm going to keep you from falling on the floor, breaking a hip and dying. How about that? There you go. That's totally motivation <laughs> for me. I don't want to die. <laughs> you may want to say that a little differently. However, exactly. you get my point. You always want to know exactly. because your clients will ask you why and not because yep. I said so. Yes, don't absolutely. No. I think you said that so well, Wendy. And again, we're going to put up our contact information here. So we always encourage you to ask us and give us ideas on any topics, but we will circle back on this, this one because we could go through hundreds of different exercises. We just pick some of the most common. So maybe in a month or so, you know, we can come back to this topic, do this, not that. If you send us some of the exercises you want us to, to dissect, we'll be happy to do it. So Wendy, why don't you tell the great people where they can find you? Yes. If you guys would like to email me, you can contact me or find me at wendy.bats at nasn.org, or you can look me up on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And then my information is coming up right here. Email is marty.miller at nasm.org. And then Instagram is dr.martymiller72. So Wendy, thanks so much for all the amazing insight as always. And to all of our NASM family out there, Thank you for joining. We look forward to seeing you again very soon on the next Master Instructor Roundtable.